Okay, let's, uh, let's get going. So good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to uh, this third session of our lecture series uh, on the state of architecture in South Asia, looking at emergent practices in South Asia. Uh, this is a third uh, of that series and a very special one, at least for me, it's very special because today's practitioners I've known from the start of their careers and really have watched their work evolve. And so it's um, just fantastic to be hosting this, uh, to see uh, you know, what they've been doing and more recent work. But in any case, this is a project um, where we are looking at the state of architecture in South Asia. Some of you have joined us uh, for earlier sessions and those of you who haven't, uh, this has three components, the projects. Uh, the first component of the project is this a lecture series, which is on emergent practices, because we thought we must start with looking at what is happening in South Asia and what the present generation of practitioners are thinking about and articulating as the issues that are most important in South Asia. The second component uh, is um, a conference that we are planning uh, in March and followed by, we hope, forms of exhibitions or publications. And it's a project we imagine stretch o stretched over uh, two or three years. Uh, <clears throat> the project also involves a lot of partners and I just wanna thank them before I go to the introductions. Uh, the partners are the Graduate School of Design, the Lakshmi Mittal Institute of South Asia. And I wanna thank Hitesh Hathi and Selman Rafi from the South Asia Center for all their support, the Architecture Foundation India, where Ela Single, the director has been a great support. And most importantly, the South Asia Students Group at the GSD, uh, that have really driven this uh, process uh, and supported it. And their co-chairs, Pranav and Dhruv, uh, and uh, their team, which is Amna, Devashri, and Rolando. So thank you all very much for this. As you can see on the poster and this, on the screen, uh, the next events are the Saturdays of November 5th, November 12th, and November 19th. And this coming week, we will send out postings of the speakers for those three sessions, which is six more speakers uh, that we will announce. And we're going to be moving uh, within the South Asian context to now to Bhutan, to Pakistan, to Afghanistan. And we're going to have practitioners from those countries who will comprise uh, the ne next uh, session. So look forward to seeing many of you there. <clears throat> With that, I want to start by uh, introducing uh, Vinu Daniel, uh, who will speak second, but I'll introduce him first. Uh, Vinu uh, studied architecture in uh, Trivandrum in the College of Engineering. And then he worked uh, at the Oroville Earth Institute for the UNDP, uh, involved in their post-tsunami construction. Uh, in, from, then he returned to Pondicherry in 2007. He started Wallmakers, uh, the name of his practice, uh, which was really christened by others uh, as their first project was to make a compound wall. And so they became wall makers. And But luckily he didn't get stuck in only doing compound walls. And he sort of morphed his compound walls into beautiful uh, architectural projects. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and his focus has since been the question of uh, cost-effective, sustainable, but it's more than that. It's, 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 it's not just... Uh, the pragmatic categories of sustainability or cost effectiveness, but it's how beauty can be extracted from frugal means. And its practice has now spanned over a decade uh, and has been recognized by Arc Daily, by, uh, you know, he's been on the list of Indian practices, um, uh, on 20 Indian practices of 2020. Uh, he's sort of won a number of awards, both nationally and internationally. And most recently, actually a few weeks ago, the Royal Academy Dorfman Award of 2022. He also sort of really is um, looking at or trying to articulate in terms of architectural challenges, uh, what we should be building uh, given the crisis, the planetary crisis in many ways. Uh, of environment, of pollution, uh, of how we use materials and how we deal with the material life cycles, uh, how we uh, stop extraction practice practices that disrupt ecologies. Uh, and so it, his work does involve 
a lot of uh, extra not extraction but reusing material from the site found material uh, and uh, his belief is that from that comes a sustainable architecture but embodied a lot very very uh, 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 beautifully uh, in terms of ways uh, things are articulated uh, spatially. Our second speaker or our first speaker, our second person on the panel is Rohan Chohan. <clears throat> he's an architect and designer based in Mumbai and he's the founder of RC Architects, a design practice that engages with projects and issues related to public and community sanitation, urban design, affordable and low cost housing, single family houses, space design and institutions. So uh, Rohan's ambition is to work across this spectrum. Uh, and you know his practice has been very fortunate sometimes to initiate projects across that spectrum and sometimes uh, have been commissioned to do work uh, across that spectrum. And his uh, <clears throat> approach, uh, is, is recognizing, discerning, and responding to living patterns. That is the kind of associative value people bring to spaces and how that can be modulated uh, through design practice and the conception of architecture. And so he sort of fuses modern materials, uh, but is inspired by vernacular patterns, creating spaces, you know, which are again, uh, uh, very rich in natural light in their response to the landscape. Uh, etc. And he believes that architecture as a science emerge from man's humble need for shelter, home in the purest form of design. So there's a kind of simplicity that he almost overstates uh, as a way to respond to that sort of feeling uh, that he has uh, in terms of aspiring to create a sense of timelessness. So it's they're, they're, what we're going to see are two very similar but yet very different approaches that come and work in different kinds of geographies. And Rohan was recently among the top 10 finalists for the debut award at the Lisbon Architecture Triennale from where he very recently returned. So with that, uh, I'm really excited about today, today's um, uh, discussions and presentations and really a great pleasure to have you both here and look forward to seeing your work, hearing from you and having a discussion. Please try to present within 25 minutes, even if you have to go fast, yeah, that will yeah. give us a little time for discussion. And I'm just warning you, I might um, interrupt you at 20 minutes to just tell you okay. you have five minutes left. Okay. Yes. So thank you. And Rohan, with that, if you could share yeah. your screen and Vinu, okay. you could follow uh, Rohan right after he finishes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, Rahul, thank you so much for that introduction. I think uh, I'm, it's quite overwhelming coming from you because I started my career just uh, after stopping working with you. And yeah, it's quite overwhelming. Thank you so much. So um, today I'm going to uh, present our projects under the title City as a Spiritual Factory. So every time we do projects, we are trying to position it in a certain idea or a certain framework. So today I would like to discuss this as the aspect of how our projects are trying to, you know, uh, respond to this idea of spirituality. Uh, so the, uh, the actual meaning of the word um, is uh, trying to be concerned with the human spirit uh, and trying to go beyond the material or the physical aspects uh, of an entity. And that's what uh, we are trying to address through architecture or the prototypes uh, that uh, we have been designing on uh, different subjects. So in order to make room for experience uh, beyond the physical dimensions, make the user relate to a space in spirit, the making of it would respond to the basic rational, such as uh, human scale, proportion and user group lifestyle and thereby generate a systematic design process. So that is uh, how we are trying to look at these various typologies through this framework. And just to like set this premise, and, I mean, uh, trying to take you through just like a few images of the project, like basically today we are going to look at four projects in detail, 
but I will just take you through the premise of what I'm talking about. So uh, this is the light box, the restroom for women that we've designed, but here the restroom clearly becomes like a project that goes beyond the brief and kind of address the issues where uh, the women can feel safe and comfortable uh, within the cities. Or the pause restrooms where it creates like a homogeneous environment for the truck drivers who do not have any facilities on the highway. Or uh, the toilet and courtyard, we did this on the Bandra station where the courtyard kind of becomes an opportunity where the passerbys can just come in and use this facility like their homes. Or for that matter, even uh, we go into the private, private domain, the affordable housing project that we recently completed. The shared terrace gardens kind of become an extension of the day-to-day -day life of the inhabitants. Or the truck driver's village where such niches kind of give them an opportunity to connect with the fellow drivers and kind of forget about the stress that they're dealing with uh, in the day-to-day -day routine. Or again, going into a private domain or in a single family house where the courtyards and the roof gardens kind of again become an extension to the day-to-day -day activities or a dormitory in a transient housing, which again creates another opportunity for the truck drivers to inhabit along the highway. I will just play this video that encapsulates the light box project, and then uh, we will look into the next slides. The brief given by the NGO was pretty straightforward. They wanted a restroom for women and a WC for the handicapped. It actually helped us to take the word restroom quite literally and create a resting space. The public toilet is just 30% and the 70% of the space is just landscape where women can come sit, maybe read a book, you know, a newspaper. That triggered a new concept of what public toilets could be. The material palette is completely governed by how the climate works and secondly, how we can ease the maintenance of the restroom. If you see all the outer walls are made of stainless steel, which are easy to clean and protecting the restroom from the outer side. 70% of the space is the landscape, so there we have just defined it with perforated metal, which allows a lot of natural light coming inside, a lot of ventilation happens. It's more like you are indoor, but still you are in the outdoors. The whole idea of this tree it takes you back to the vernacular setting. Trees are always looked up as the best resting places. People like very casually go and sit under the tree and then they start chatting and then they spend hours there. Earlier we had plans to plant trees and create like a lot of lands. The tree was already there. So we thought like why not build around it and then use the natural setting. The most sustainable architecture that we have resides in the villages. Because there are no architects who go and design those buildings. Just the users, they respond to the climate, they respond to their needs. So this whole prototype really responds to the city's needs. So in reference to the light box, uh, it was uh, further published in the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And this was the pretext written in reference to that which uh, kind of highlighted about the women uh, uh, and the safety for women in public spaces, as well as their equal rights in uh, the urban infrastructure. And this was an, uh, a picture we took during the construction of the light box. It kind of encapsulates the entire problem in this one image where the women is standing in a very uncomfortable condition and any, in, in a very unhygienic uh, atmosphere. Uh, so this project we proposed to the um, corporation and uh, somehow they liked it. Everyone got excited about it and they uh, showed us four different sites out of which we selected uh, the best possible site. 
and uh, what happened is the moment we uh, defined the area suddenly people started inhabiting this space because there was a tree and so i realized that the concept started evolving right from the moment where we decided you know where to build and that's where i felt that it's a uh, kind of a successful intervention and yeah so that's that's the image of the light box after completion and the the quality of light and the atmosphere is exactly uh, we try to you know keep it same as uh, it was when the building uh, prototype was not there. That's the diagram of the light box. So the black uh, rectangle is the resting area and which is supported by the toilets on either sides. This is a plan. I'll just quickly run through the plan. So at the two ends we have uh, on the left hand side, it's the, uh, it's the Indian WC and the European WC. And on the right hand side, we have a nursing station and handicap toilet, which is accessed from the handicap toilet is accessed from outside. And then the central area is completely landscaped with uh, benches and other amenities that support the toilet box. And that is how it appears to be uh, a semi-transparent skin, which one can see through and the quality of light keeps changing throughout the day. And at night, uh, the reverse happens that the light comes from within the light box and then it kind of lifts uh, a certain radius around uh, the prototype, which uh, uh, helps the women to feel safe in this and that's uh, looking towards the city that is inside the light box, the central area. And these are the various components that we use to construct the light box. Uh, it's su supported with a biodigester, which is below the ground. And then uh, above the plinth, it is all dry construction with uh, metal framing, ACP panels, perforated metal, and polycarbonate roof. So the same idea we tried to postulate for another project. So this, we were working with the Indian railways and trying to propose this prototypes on, on all the local uh, stations um, in Mumbai, but somehow that this, this didn't go ahead, uh, but we tried to use the same material palette, the perforated metal and uh, epoxy flooring, which is easy to maintain and clean. And going ahead, we thought of creating like a family of restroom because in a city, you never know what kind of space you would get. So the one that we built is uh, a large prototype. And then we, if you see on the right, we have the medium and the small and the extra large. Uh, so based on the spaces available in the city, they kind of modulate to adjust itself in the context. And um, on the other hand, we thought of creating certain variants which um, may be transformed into a different program. Maybe it would be a bus stop or a hawker shop or maybe a, a, a gram panchayat office in a village or a tea stall. So we're still working with these kind of ideas with uh, the prototype, which has like central open space and supported with activities on both the sides. Um, so when we started working on sanitation on a way, we um, addressed another issue which was related to the truck drivers. So um, this is a text that I've extracted uh, to kind of present the issue. And uh, the important part uh, from this is in 1980 to every thousand trucks, there were 1300 drivers. And this number reduced to 750 by 2012 and it's predicted to come down to 450. And this is just because of lack of amenities uh, on the highway. And in fact, these people are very important for us because they kind of export uh, the goods uh, locally uh, to different states. And just to give you a sense of what kind of context they dwell into, and this is the context that they're constantly in, constantly driving for 22 hours without any uh, pit stops, even if they, take a pit stop, um, they don't have good facilities like a restroom or a place where they can uh, nap or rejuvenate or maybe get a haircut or a massage. So as, as a response to this, uh, we came up with uh, this project, uh, the paused restrooms, but this does not deal completely uh, uh, with the truck drivers. So it has like the 60% component is for the common public and the remaining 40% it's for the truck drivers. But uh, this project was conceived in a, a fuel station campus 
so that uh, the truck drivers can also use this facility. And when, after one arrives at this project, there are multiple access points. So one can uh, understand and decide like which uh, point to navigate to. And it is supported with signages in both languages. So the truck drivers can understand very well of what they're looking at. And these are the access points that take the mail, uh, take the people uh, to the mail toilet uh, through a passage. And inside the mail toilet, it's completely uh, open to the roof. It's not open to sky. There is a roof that covers these open to sky spaces, the uh, open uh, spaces so that the water doesn't come inside. And um, this openness is designed to, in a way to uh, dry the toilets quickly and also to get uh, ventilation and a fresh atmosphere within the space. And then again, these are certain niches within the project where uh, uh, there are smaller verandas where the women can wait or uh, the, the, these verandas give access to the women to, women's toilet. That's inside. So here also we have tried to use the similar idea where we have these open to roof kind of spaces that create a lot of light and ventilation to dry the toilets faster. And this is an isometric that shows all the components coming together. So in this project, uh, we, uh, we did also did a lot of work on signages because we thought the communication design plays a very important role in uh, uh, a toilet campus. So we, we have designed signages in two different languages, starting from Marathi. It's Marathi and Hindi. I mean, the Devanagari really is the same. But uh, yeah, uh, creating iconography and the uh, and the text at the same time, uh, kind of make everyone understand what they're looking at. And these are the door metal signs. And then when the uh, people navigate towards the truck driver's area, uh, they find one shop which uh, sells like very basic uh, items like water bottles or uh, packets of chips or any other or biscuits, uh, the basic things that one needs while traveling. And then one enters through the grooming center into the truck driver's area, which is then further, um, uh, which is further lined with beds in the recreational space. And then these are like charpoys where even the detail of the bed sheet, if you see, we have tried to keep it very vernacular so that even this building is so red and stark, they still feel comfortable within this space just because of that bed sheet and the jaw point. And yeah, this is um, the side elevation, which clearly expresses many uh, different components. And the horizontal band is introduced just to kind of cut the vision of anyone looking into the toilet inside the toilet because the uh, some spaces of the toilet are open to the roof and here the client was uh, very keen on having like a dedicated staff so that uh, uh, one can maintain these projects really well because for sanitation projects even after the after successful design idea it is important how one can maintain this project uh, while you know, I mean, it's getting used after this. And this, the same issue of the truck drivers, I'll play another short film. तो काम करना है ना पड़ेगा दिन
ढोल मिट्टी से तो मतलब डेली नहाना है पानी से नहाए आदमी या ना नहाए लेकिन धूल मिट्टी से डेली नहाना हर परिवार का याद हर हमेशा ही आता रहता है या खाना खाने वक्त कभी टाइम मिलता है सोने वक्त मतलब याद तो आना ही सबसे ज्यादा मार हमको हमारे बच्चों की और मम्मी की याद करता है बाहर जब हम निकलते हैं तो मेरा ये घर परिवार सब यही है हमारा घर परिवार वहां भी है और यहाँ आने के बाद यहाँ भी Rohan, about five more minutes, please. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just quickly run through. So the same issue that we were dealing as for the uh, while we designed the pause restrooms was you know kind of uh, looked at it in a way at a larger scale. So we created this facility um, around eight thousand square feet, and it uh, had fuel station and parking for fifty trucks. And that's the overall layout. It's a triangular building because the site was a parallelogram, and we had to like respect the lines of the site, and that's how it came out into a triangle. And uh, yeah, that's the. so these these are the various spaces that we just saw and since it was located in chitradurg so we thought the landscape should represent that and then the spaces and then we have these kind of niches where the truck drivers can talk to each other and can forget their stress and their dormitories which are around a courtyard where uh, there are bunk beds and uh, this is the last project i'm talking about uh, it's uh, a transient housing in rajasthan again for the truck drivers so not a facility building but a housing for them and it is supported with a uh, the site is a linear strip so on the rear side there's a parking for trucks and the front is the building and uh, again here we have a department store a barber shop and a chai shop which uh, is very vernacular in nature and then we have these housing units so each housing is like a t shaped unit and it inhabits around eight uh, truck drivers so they kind of uh, interlock with each other and form the habitat 
and the maximum yeah they're sharing of walls so that can reduce the cost and that's how these units are placed so there's an accommodation for 48 truck drivers in this campus and yeah that's how it is laid out so each uh, they share the toilets and the common spaces and these are the courtyards uh, again to kind of combat the heat of rajasthan we've used jalis and courtyards which are very intimate and they kind of cut the heat and the courtyards are shared by eight drivers so they kind of form like a certain kind of a relation with each other when they're staying here they become friends or may not become friends and then there's a common area which we have just left it open because there's a tendency that the truck drivers carry their own food and vessels so we have just created a common space where they can use the kitchen they can make their own tea there are no there's no furniture it's just like a bench and floor they can sit wherever they feel like and you know be comfortable in this atmosphere and again the recreational spaces and the roof is open to them in the evening and at night to kind of hang out with the fellow drivers yeah it's a very simple and uh, uh, early structure and yeah so that's that's how it is laid out overall and that's where we think that um i mean looking at these issues the city is a spiritual factory creating everything that concerns us i mean that's that's where uh, this thought process is kind of coming from yeah thank you and that's the overview of our practice thank you so much thank you thank you rohan thank you very much and really on time really appreciate that and of course there are many questions which we'll uh, you know discuss uh, during yeah. uh, the uh, after venus uh, yeah. presentation yeah. but really clearly i just sort of uh, we won't get into this now but really yeah. i mean i think the first question comes to mind is who you're building this for in the sense who facilitates this project because this seems to be a unique client uh, yeah. yeah and for both the toilets and the truck stops it will be nice to hear yes. from you the story of how you got these projects and how yes, yes, you got yes. them going so thank you yeah, and we'll sure. come to that in a minute yeah okay, okay. Sure. so uh vinu if you can share your screen and make your presentation thank you ron we'll discuss it after vinu's presentation yeah sure definitely <clears throat> So, hi guys. Uh, I'm hoping you are able to see my. Yeah, just just hit the full screen. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, so I I had to go at uh, express pace because uh, uh, you know because the time is limited. So uh, my dear friends, before I start, uh, I have to talk. Before I start about my journey, I have to talk about two types of practice which is known to us. Uh, the first thing is uh, so something which we have all learned from our colleges, from our uh, academia, uh, what we call as something like a linear practice. Uh, what linear practice means is that um, the architect designs on paper and the paper travels all the way to the site via the contractor, via the mason. And, uh, and that is the way how we have all practiced and uh, uh, almost 90 percentage of the world still practices it. It is the reason how we have built our cities and all those things. But uh, looking back, there is one small problem with uh, with that kind of practice. You know, the feedback is never there. That is one of the one of the disadvantages of such a practice because the paper never travels back to the architect's office. You know, the paper never says that you know like this much destruction happened. You know, we have erased we have erased forests for cities in this scenario. So non-linear architecture practice is what we uh, as wall makers practice and. Uh, it would be ungrateful on my part to talk about this non-linear practice without talking about the first person who really authored this kind of practice. That is Lord. Okay. Architecture. What non-linear architecture by, by that, what we need is that the architect is the one who is traveling from place to place and the and the feedback is going directly to the architect and the architect makes changes based on what is happening at this site now you can see in
Vinu, this question, Vinu, 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 your voice is breaking. If you like, put your video off, it might help. Hello? Yeah, Vinu, your voice was breaking. So if you want to put your video off, it might help. Uh, hello? Okay, okay, okay. I, I think that would be... Uh... So basically, is it better now? Yeah, it's better. Thank you. Okay, okay. So basically, Lori Baker was somebody who pioneered non-linear practice. And he went to site, to site, to site. And thereby understanding what his buildings, uh, which I believe many architects should understand. And, the, and, and my idea of presenting here today is basically to showcase another alternate practice. And the major reason for that is that architects, when they go to their site sufficiently, would be able to understand what is the ground impact. Because uh, primarily, I believe architecture is a sin in some sense. And to reduce the drastic impacts, when the architect travels to the site, as you can see in the picture. Now, one of the big questions many a time people ask is that they feel that uh, this kind of practice may not be scalable. But... Let me remind you that the British architect Lori Baker had completed more than 1,000 projects in India during his lifetime, So, which makes it very scalable. Now, while this philosophy was very, very uh, strong in our mind, the one thing which we lack whenever we study in colleges is the techniques or the real, profession, the, the real practice uh, or the real skill of practice is something which we all lack. This was provided to me by another European gentleman, Satpre Maini, who stayed in Auroville, Auroville who, who, who is the director of Auroville Health Institute. And with his teachings and blessings, we were very good. Uh, I mean, like we were, we were taught very much about earth architecture and how to construct. So armed with a good philosophy and with uh, uh, good technique, technique, techniques taught by Satpre Maini, we shifted back to Kerala. And this was the result, inch by inch. So we had to start, as uh, Rahulji very correctly said, we didn't get any buildings to build with. We just had some few few projects here and there. Whenever we would say we are building with mud blocks, we will be chucked out of the site. You know, so we would be forced to build uh, either small small things like compound walls uh, using waste materials and stuff like that. You can see actually this is my brother and his friend who are not even architects who are helping me out in, uh, in my initial stages of the career. So inch by inch, we moved forward, uh, taking, taking sustainability as a course. We never knew that our future was this hard during those times. And we were, we were, we were struggling almost daily to earn our daily bread. But, but inch by inch is the correct term, we can say. We gathered up masons, we gathered up people, we started giving classes to many people and tell them the importance of doing mud architecture. So what you see in here are small, small constructions, which were literally uh, built with, uh, you know, with, with peanut money. And these are constructions which really taught us about our architecture and philosophy today. And we could also take these classes, lessons, and improve further on our ideology. Now, uh, slowly, slowly, we understood that we had to train our masons to aspire further, train our craftsmen to look further than what they have been already practicing. Surely our, our engagement with architecture and drawings and all those things had benefited a lot for us in, in, in understanding how these new technologies can create a new language. So slowly and steadily, we started to get, you know, bigger projects, um, bigger uh, uh, mud works and everything and and and, and it, it was during this time that our craft we can say in uh, this is something which we call as compressed stabilized earth break. and uh, at this point this is somewhere around 2011 or 2012 by this time we had been quite uh, uh, proficient in making this type of earth construction and we saw that we could create different different results with this kind of constructions uh, we could create nubian arches mud brick arches all those things and scale it up to a different level many many years and it can be something which is much much more sustainable that than what many others think it 
to be so slowly and steadily our language started to change we uh, incorporated ferrocement works uh, along with this we started to take away all the fancy flooring and we started to take in the ideal which mahatma gandhi ji told lori baker long back that the ideal house should be built within materials of a 5 mile radius this was something which we took it very seriously and very into our hearts because lori baker also was somebody who was very influential in our in our practice now the next building i am showing is something made with five bricks so you should understand uh, lori baker spent his entire life making five brick construction which was sustainable at that time but by the time i came into the picture we found out that most of the fields have been uh, in, uh, has been dead and buried and you know like built over by cities and five brick industry almost came to a standstill so this is a residence which we made with a modified rat trap bond so this was a final goodbye to five bricks for us because that material just simply ran out of the 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 country i believe because there were no more no more country five bricks being made and uh, these were bricks made by societies they were not private owned uh, country uh, fired brick kins so we thought okay we will do this last one last time and exposed brick work for us because i had been always working with mud brick and i thought this is my last chance to pay a tribute or an ode to lori baker and to the sustainable brick practice that he had ambition for such a long time and these are my wonderful masons here who are uh, very instrumental and the, uh, and though they may look very old but uh, most of them have been hand trained by us itself and uh, today our practice has moved to a different area simply because these craftsmen has been with us from the start till today we are now numbering around 150 people in terms of masons and craftsmen so as we move further we thought can we just stay with the traditional materials mud construction which we already showed you you know cscb which i learned from moravel earth zero is that alone sufficient so what you can see here is myself and with my client mr biju matthew who wanted to build a residence with mud but when i went to the site i was alarmed to see that there was a lot of waste debris that was lying strewn in this site simply because others had built before him they they would always build you know how architects and construction is we would always build and leave some waste so what we did is we we kind of were kind of trying some new techniques and we thought maybe within a mesh we can fill up all this waste debris and get walls like this you know like how you see right now and then our vocabulary further changed when we found out that there is a lot of scrap in our country a lot of places for scrap and architects do not have to again design with new materials what you see in front of you is again uh, this washing machine were pull uh, washing machine wheels which is found abundantly in scrap yards so with that we kind of just all we had to do was just to find a method to join these materials you know these are lying in our scraps all across the country and you can see the kind of products that you get with it once you start to understand that waste is the way forward these are meter boxes this electrical meter board boxes which is you know um which was changed to plastic ones recently so while that that uh, change over was happening we happen to find a lot of these electrical meter box uh, meter boxes we use them in their grills and you can see to the left side is the debris wall which we showcased earlier and to the right side is randal so we started to think waste utilizing waste is a mandatory thing we cannot simply move forward without utilizing waste then slowly slowly we started incorporating waste inside our shutters too so this particular technology is called shuttered debris wall so we started slow and small with this and we initially found out that this is a very load bearing uh, type of uh, wall structure and we made a three story structure of course with the uh, compound beams and everything still we made a, a very particular load bearing structure with this shuttered debris wall and you can see that the basic idea behind this in terms of design it was a west facing building and and most of the times the skill has to be taught by the one who leads itself and 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 you can see the shutters in there and these are basic debris 
which we have converted into wall material. As predicted, uh, Kerala went into overdrive, uh, and uh, we we were warned that this kind of large scale construction, the, the large scale cement construction, and everything would lead because Kerala is an eco sensitive place. We were warned by the ecologist Madhav Gadgil that Kerala would suffer uh, way back in 2013. That if we go on with this kind of construction, we would endure calamity. And sure enough, we got it. Uh, in 2018, and he also predicted that this would be an ongoing continuation of such kind of scenario. So now you can see this is Chennamangalam Weavers community. The problem here was that this is a very traditional handloom industry, which was completely destroyed by the floods. And what was left over was a lot of lot of wasted clothes. You know, once it is wet, you cannot sell it in the market. So what we did with these materials. So slowly we were becoming a practice which was trying to see what we can do in the bigger picture. And we saw that these waste materials, we already practice a bit with waste clothes. And we saw that with a bit of mud and lime, we can convert them into chairs, we can convert them into partitions. Uh, this is available at the Barbican Center in London. Uh, and we were able to convert all these wasted flood materials into this kind of constructions. And you can see this is a cafe again. So utilizing these waste materials has been our priority uh, for the last, let's say, three, four years. And we have been uh, making a, a lot of uh, uh, study on these kind of materials and their permanence and all those things. And we have found very interesting results and very encouraging results for these kind of constructions. So you can see from wash basin all the way to partitions, tables, chairs, what not we can do with this kind of construction. So this is a list of our... Uh, our materials, which we modified from the existing traditional materials, these include shutter debris wall, brick panels, cloth crate, debris wall, precast bottle beams, modified rat trap, what not. This is 15 years of our practice, and every day doing a, a, a very small research has, uh, you know, made us to this place. So now, what we were thinking was, can we find new spaces with these wasted materials? And sure enough, this is another project called Ledge House which I believe was completely made with all types of waste materials, like scaffolding wood, which we generally tend to waste. We, we mix it with boric borax and uh, we made a small house with all these wasted materials. When we excavated, we found these small stones in the site and we thought we have to make new walls with it. So this, the gentleman on the left hand is nephew. Uh, the gentleman on the left was my first mason when I showed you my first beer bottle, some construction. It's the same guy who is still now practicing with us. You know, now his next generation also joined us, which is a wonderful thing for us. So you can see his nephew now taking more better strides in it. So this particular project is something which is very recent. And this also features something called, uh, you know, symbiosis, which I will keep on explaining in the
uh, very soon we were thinking about the next process was that can we involve the real clients of the site so this is another project in which we kind of found out that uh, that the low lying areas of we could so, soon find out that in a place like trivandrum the problem was that you know like very often we fill up our sites and then let the swamps run dry and then build buildings and then we face the floods and problems so similarly i had a site in trivandrum where there was an already existing swamp and the swamp had you know uh, two uh, you know like it has its swamp creatures and everything and when we suggested to the client that we can survive with uh, with uh, without destroying the particular swamp so we started to think that the real clients is not just humans but also uh, you know the the original inhabitants of the land the flora and the fauna also should be protected so as you can see this small swamp was something which was very important for us but uh, the more we work with it and we found out that you know like these creatures are so necessary including snakes and in this particular project we kind of utilize bamboo bamboo is generally known as a fragile material and it is not exactly considered as a modern house material because people think that bamboo can be cut through and the safety and security is 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 a, is a concern but we found out a technique in which we can instill uh, we can install steel rods through bamboo and then it can become a very versatile facade or strong structural member so as you can see in here we made an entire building with mud blocks and and bamboo as our facade and the bamboo facade also make sure that you know like there is a staircase which it holds up and the swamp was again protected so as you can see here So the interesting part is the swamp was still there. The swamp survived the onslaught of construction, and we made sure that all the inhabitants of the swamp still survive, while making sure that the safety and uh, and the security of the inhabitants of the house is paramount. But the interesting story is, as soon as we finished construction, even though the swamp was something which was very important. Uh, the lady of the house found uh, the snakes to be disturbing and she actually killed them even though they were of no harm to anybody in the in the area because we made it an enclosure and later she actually said that that you know like uh, the absence of this snakes there are a lot of rodents and pests so i said madam you killed the only protector the same protector which was supposed to protect you from this particular land was now killed now this is another project of ours in which we understood that the land was really infested with because this is was the last urban piece which was not constructed and there were a lot of creepy crawlies out there and we thought we would make a construction where we literally made the house a subterranean house and 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 the ground is left aloof for all the creepy crawlies or the creatures of the nature to survive <laughs> this is not something which doesn't have precedent because in kerala there were a lot of things called sacred groves for a long period of time so as you can see here the ground was left uh, aloof so that nobody would disturb it such places are called sacred groves and this kind of ecological systems were very necessary in the earlier days so now we made something where the entire building is either subterranean or above the ground floor and the ground part is left for uh nature creatures to roam around freely as you can see in this picture the entire design is based on that so slowly we thought we could increase our scale in practice and uh, this is a jute sack uh, concreted pavilion which we did for the binale way back in 2014 this is the largest pavilion conoid pavilion ever built with ferro cement this is again another commercial construction that is happening in 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 ahmedabad where we are doing eight story structure uh with mud bricks um, which is made nearby the site itself there's again another school which is happening uh with this uh, this the this uh, something called a reciprocal beam which is used uh to make 
with uh, mud composite beams the courtyard for the school so the school is a, a an interesting idea in here where you know like it has a central courtyard and a lot of classrooms around it and we made sure that we do not destroy any of the trees in the property uh, it was a it was a big task more than 50 trees were there in the property because this is a large school but we made sure that we never cut any of the trees and they will still survive even after we finish so while we scratched the surface about 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 waste we understood that the waste problem in india and the world altogether is a huge huge problem per day the amount of tires just just the wasted tires which is coming to our country is around per day is around 3 lakh tires and uh, 3 lakh tires we are also producing this is the official records for uh, the indian government and you can imagine the unofficial must be much much higher so all these waste is accumulated even even foreign countries including europe are sending their waste tires into india as garbage dump so the big problem which we are having right now is that you know like our people are saying we will do pyrolysis we will do proper this thing but these are all fake things we found the mafia who are making these tires while we were trying to do, think about doing something with these waste tires we found out that the tires are being reheated and used on the tar, tar uh, for tarring the roads which is a big problem for us in our future because as you can very well imagine tires are uh, here uh, I mean, like firing tires especially under uh, open open circumstances is one of the worst things you can do and pollute our atmosphere the one place you can hide your tires is actually houses so this is recent constructions we are doing residences all with tires and you don't have to stabilize your mud anymore tires are the best enclosures so you can actually make marvelous this is a museum which we are building for S.P. Bala Subramaniam, a late singer, legendary singer. His museum is going to be built entirely with tires. This is a three-story structure, and we are going to build it with tires. And it has a lot of vaults and arches, and all those techniques can be utilized. Now, to, to round it off, you know, I'm sure uh, the time we have crossed it, but to round it off, this is the last part, which I would really love our people to see, is that this is a place in Tiricharapalli uh, where the entire... <laughs> And our village is somewhat. I love my country. The entire village is actually submerged inside a dumbia. So these kids every day travel to the school via five story dumps. So this is our brothers and our sisters who has to lead a life. Some fate of luck actually didn't make us born in this particular area. But just look at the state of our country at this point of time. We shouldn't escape the eyes of uh, the new generation architects because I believe all this waste can be converted because we are still building homes. And to my country, to my people, I pledge my devotion. In the building, and prosperity along life my happiness jahin thank you vinu vinu can you hear us yeah yeah i'm, I'm okay now you can start. thank you thank you thank you now you can appear again yes thank you so, you know, let's, we've got about half an hour. So let's just get into the discussion. First of all, thank you both very much uh, for your presentations. Uh, you're quite a pairing, like I said in the beginning. I think the values you're bringing, uh, both for community, for nation, for the current issues are very similar. You seemingly do them in different ways, but for me, many things resonate, which tie your practices together. And I think that's the reason why we do these pairings so that we can begin to have conversations. And, you know, really, um, it's it's not one or the other. I mean, I think we know, uh, I, I, I think that was a very compelling argument. I love the architect wearing a tie in the linear process that you have in your diagram, a very kind of formal Western <laughs> kind of uh, proposition. And, so but I yet, you know, so, sorry? He stole it from internet. So yes, uh, yes, correct. Internet, internet theft. 
so uh, it's, you know, I mean, as you know, and uh, we know that's when we came across each other the first time when I was doing my book 12 years ago on architecture in India. And, um, uh, and uh, one of the propositions in the book is that there are many simultaneously valid ways of building. Uh, and um, it's sometimes not this or that, but it's how we make transitions from the ones that have negative impact to the ones that would have a positive impact. And so, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's just a lot to discuss, which we can't even do in this half an hour, but let me try. So I think what ties your practices together, which for me is really, really, really important, is uh, that you have both explored the geographies outside the mega cities, that you have gone out into places. I mean, of course, you've done things in mega cities, but you're trying to also address the need, the instrumentality, the agency of architecture and transforming many other parts of the country which don't fall under the radar often of most practitioners. And as I always describe, the big cities in India and South Asia are like black holes. They suck up all the financial as well as the intellectual capital of the countries. Uh, so everyone is focusing their attention on those where we're not going to solve problems. So for me, that is really very encouraging that you both have made that effort and done viable things uh, in these sorts of places. Now, uh, I, 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 the other thing that I think is very intriguing, which I would like to discuss a little bit to start with, and then we can go into each of the practices specifically, uh, well, let me say one more thing, which I was going to say, uh, which is which is a contrast, uh, which is you both use um, uh, well, well, one of you exposes all its material in its rawness, and one of you paints over the materials, uh, but you use singular materials in a very simple way. And we know you use a multiplicity of materials and they all sort of express their textures. That's very striking in some ways. And I, I don't mean this as a criticism at all. I just mean it as an observation okay. that it, I couldn't help but uh, share. Uh, um, yeah, and we'll come back to that a little bit. But I think I just want to start with uh, the question and because you know we also have an audience that's younger practices among uh, many others uh, but it's a question that's coming up in all our discussions is what are the new forms of patronage so i think we know in your case you know you have said my early projects were all relatives and now i've built a constituency of confidence and i'm you know you're doing other very important projects uh, but i would like to hear a little bit about that jump from relatives to um, uh, how uh, you build a constituency because the people that you are building for are very unusual, meaning it's either, uh, you know, legendary a musician for the museum or the Biennale, etc. And Rohan, in your case, and I'd like to start with Rohan, uh, it's a question I think on everybody's mind. Who got him to do these toilets or did you initiate them or what was, how did you go about doing that? Because that's, you know, it, it seems like there's no client for that. Mm. No, I think uh, it's a very funny story. The first, the light box that we started, uh, it was an advertisement on Facebook. So that was the time when we were looking for projects in the initial years. And I just responded to the advertisement and it was uh, initiated by an NGO called Agasti who were trying to build toilets during that time. And uh, I approached him then, uh, they had a brief set. So they said like, you know, 10 by 30 and all the components they wanted within that. Then we proposed our idea. It's, it's the same that the one that we have built, nothing, I mean, we didn't change much, uh, unfortunately. And uh, then we teamed up and then went to the city corporation and they liked it. And then they asked us to build one prototype. And that's how it uh, started growing organically. And then Someone saw the light box online and then they approached us to, you know, build the pause restrooms. So then that was a private line, but the pause restroom was built by a fuel station owner. So how it works is the fuel station, if they have a facility for truck drivers and then when the truck drivers know, they kind of come there, park their vehicles, stay there. And uh, while leaving, they fill up their uh, fuel tanks and that way the sales of the fuel also goes high, you know, so that's how they try to club it and even the Chitradurga project that was also a fuel station owner so he wanted to create a campus where part of it is a fuel station then the facility building and then the like 50 spaces for truck parking and you know but, but, but that's very interesting that yeah. that that you could you could 
by default or organically, mm -hmm. you could right. show to someone who was doing something for profit, which is a fuel right. station, that right. uh, to create a kind of social program would be a win-win situation in the sense that yeah. they, yeah. for their profit, it works well, yes. but then it gives yes. the truck drivers an amenity. Yes. It works so, for both in that sense. I mean, it also right. addresses the, yeah. Yeah, which is which is interesting because I mean I suppose that's the ultimate role of design to show right. these possibilities yes, yes, and yes, you know yes. I think it 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 works really well and just one sub question before I go to Vinu, hmm. what 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 how did you choose to make all these red? Why did you want them to stand out and not recede in the background? No, so uh, we tried the red color only for the pause restroom because um, one idea was these these buildings are used in a very robust manner and. Uh, something I noticed on these London telephone booths that uh, even if they get dirty, they, they don't seem like, you know, they're catching a lot of dirt. Like, for example, let's say this building was white. I mean, in three or four months, it would have started, you know, showing off the dirt. But why and, not indigo blue? Uh, no, so red was just to catch the attention, you know, like uh, trying to communicate uh, uh, trying to create a, a communication, like a visual communication. So mm -hmm. uh, like a passerby, because on highway, people are at 80 kilometers an hour. Mm -hmm. So if they, and just like uh, one kilometer before the restroom, we had made signages. So they understand like at a distance of thousand meters, that is a facility and then mm -hmm. they can quickly yeah. identify that. Yeah. So that's, 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 yeah. Thanks Rohan. And just, in, I'll, yeah. we'll come back to you after yeah. we discuss with Vinu, but yeah. I mean, I think I just want to compliment you in that you extract that word rest. You know, rest yeah. has become a very sacred word. And that's why when I saw uh, the video of Venus uh, Ledge House, which was, uh, uh, which was in some ways bizarrely subreal, uh, yeah. surreal, uh, what was interesting was there was always, and I think it was you, Vinu, or someone who looked like you always resting in the house in different places in front of a fire. But rest is something that's gone out of our lives. And so uh, it's just wonderful how you celebrate that by extracting it from restroom. Uh, so that was wonderful. So Vinu, I want to kind of um, also ask of you the, the same question, but I kind of want to nuance it because I don't know how specifically to ask the question. So one is patronage, and we know you started with relatives and you know and it went on and I don't necessarily need you to tell us that story because everyone knows that story but you know I mean you use Laurie Baker very much as an inspiration so my question is slightly different yes please tell us about patronage and how you see patronage evolving but also I think your um, your practice and that is the underlying premise because you say it yourself is actually questioning the model of practice and you're building off Laurie Baker as an inspiration uh, very much, right? Uh, and I think you also highlighted that you have 150 craftsmen and masons uh, now that are part of your kind of, um, uh, let me say, it's in a sense, uh, your studio uh, in some ways. So what I'm very interested in knowing is that relationship, not only with the client and the patron, but also uh, with the craftspeople, because at least the way I understand it, and I've written about, as you know, and please correct me if I'm completely wrong. Uh, in the case of Laurie Baker, it was a very loose relationship. Uh, I mean, there were some that I think he had trained and worked with, but then de depending on the sites, people were accumulated. There were maybe some master craftsmen he, he uh, communicated with directly. I'm not sure, you probably know more. So it would be good to, understand from you for this audience, what is that model of practice? What is the relationship between these various craftspeople and you? Is there a hierarchy within that? How do you organize these things? Uh, and then of course the clients. Sorry, it's a long question, but I, I think we it's all on all our minds. Yeah, uh, so I think it's a two part questions. First I should answer about the clients. Yes. And then I would come back about uh, the workers or the staff and uh, everything about it. The first part is uh, uh, my start was very inauspicious and uh, I had no clients to take and, uh, but I had a huge frustration. Sorry, we can't. Hunger, notion. No, no, Hello? you, 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 I, your I voice to, broke. I have to, you, uh, you know, high stop, uh, stop my video. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. 
yeah you yeah. you you broke when you said you had a great hunger yes so what really happened is i i had this huge uh, wonderful uh, few craftsmen i started with two or three craftsmen and i had this great idea or an idea of starting with mud architecture back in kerala this was all so nice but i had no projects and the frustration was so huge it literally enraged us we were really fighting it hard to somehow find a project we were we were ready to do anything at that point of time you know that is how we ended up doing compound wall and stuff like that so it was my sister's house that was my original project and my brother in law told me to you know like you can't do this you know and we were subjugated to making compound walls so we were thinking fine compound wall means compound wall and uh, whatever low projects that came our way we just took it we had this passion to somehow do it we were very sure that maybe it will take us 2 years 4 years 5 years ultimately it took us 10 years but you know we were very sure that we would somehow uh, you know transcend that block and one another advantage that i had because i was from the land of lorry baker already people were kind of you used to seeing exposed brick works exposed uh, brick building so in some sense quite contrary to people of other states i had it a bit more easier though i was pushing it a bit more uh, you know far so the clientele i knew that the clients would change their mind after a few years of staying it my mother herself drew me out of the house after i built the house and for 6 years she never spoke with me but after 6 years she couldn't she couldn't stay in any other house that was that was really the best success story that i had today and uh, till 2014 it was a very bad failure story but you know uh, at around 2014 she reconciled with us and she was like finding it so hard to team up in any other houses so for us client actually i never i never thought about that you know because i knew that the belief and the system was strong i will eventually land up with clients but i need to push through i need to push through this real problematic stage of starting it uh, get through the all the dilemma but there was one thing which my father taught me my father was an old businessman from ua you know and he started on his own long back so what happened there was um, the the very two or three staff that i started with mason so my started with i made sure that they were never succumbing to any sort of pressure i protected them at all cost i was not just their employer but also their teacher you know teaching them how to do this do that and all those things i got myself acquainted with how to make mud architecture and all those things and slowly our team grew and they gave the uh, how to say they they gave the assurance to other workers who who joined us and telling them you know like whatever happens you know like do not worry we can expand we can build different you know uh it is the sir who so according to them i am called uh, the the owner or sir you know the sir will take up the responsibility so this gave my workers a lot of freedom and even though i lost so many commissions midway and a lot of problems happened during works and everything these laborers or or staff stayed with us and yes there is a small hierarchy because the one who is senior is definitely the head mason and there is a different different uh, you know hierarchy based upon the experience uh, but uh, it is more like a teacher student association than an employer employee association yes so where do where do architects fit in this you must have also architects working with you and helping you and uh, or, or not yes yes architects do fit in the chain uh, the one thing is architects uh, one of the things which i mentioned earlier in the seminar was that architects originally do not get feedback you know a mason can never comment upon the activities of an architect or a helper can never comment upon the activities of an architect architect is the super in charge the white collared boss but that is not the scenario in my site in my site if the drawings do not reach everybody including myself can be screamed at by a local mason or helper because it is our duty to give them drawings and to deliver them the messages or teach them how to build this particular idea so uh, though architect falls at this thing he is he or she can be questioned so 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 there in the hierarchy it's very flat then right yes it is very flat yes 
Okay, and we'll come back to this if we uh, have other questions. But I, you know, I, I just wanted to first, I have a few things, but I wanted to uh, 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 just sort of uh, take other questions. Devashree, would you have a question for Rohan or Vinu or any questions you want to pick up from the chat? Yes. Uh, thank you both for your presentations. These very insightful glimpses into your practices. I have a question for Rohan. Um, through your projects and process, it's very clear that you think very deeply about how people use spaces, their needs for what are their needs, how communities congregate. But I'm just curious whether you have done any post-occupational surveys or interviewed people actually using the spaces to know what their feedback is, what are the aspects they like, or like any kind of negative feedback. And also like a question in the chat relates to this, that whether you did any kind of research for the women accessing public washrooms, whether that was a appropriate, an appropriate location for locating that specific project. And I will just add to that, Rohan, also, just your own reflections, because you use red so that it would weather better. How has how is it weathered? How has it been maintained? Have people looked after it? Um, yeah, I mean, um, to address the first uh, question. Um, oh no, what was the first question? I thought I the post occupancy. Have you looked at uh, post occupancy? Yeah. So uh, for the pause restrooms, we had like a feedback uh, book kept at the entrance when uh, the project was newly inaugurated and we got a lot of positive feedback uh, just because we had these five people uh, maintaining that project it was kept clean all the time um, on the other hand the light box the women were hesitant to use uh, the restrooms initially because they had never seen restrooms that were so transparent and so open um, though the uh, the toilets and the private areas are concealed inside uh, opaque surfaces but the transparency kind of made them a little uncomfortable initially, but once they understood the facilities that are being provided within the restroom, uh, we, we got a good feedback. I mean, uh, a lot of young girls were excited about uh, using this facility. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, uh, we did get a good feedback, uh, but only from the maintenance standpoint, the light box had issues because uh, there was no dedicated maintenance staff. Um, so if I visit it today, it's not in a great state, to be very honest. But on the other hand, the, the red building is kind of maintained really well. And on the weathering part, uh, the paint has come off a little bit. I mean, uh, we did try to use a weather shield paint to, you know, try and make it uh, complete, like, like a completely... Uh, uh, a sealed surface, but uh, we do have to repaint it after five, six years, I think it's been six years now. So recently only we got it repainted. So that is one issue that uh, we are facing with the painting. Devashree, any other questions or should I? Yeah, there's a question in the chat from Rohan Verma for Vinu Daniel, who is asking that um, he's, his practice has been rooted largely within a specific geography, which is South, A South India. And would he and his team of masons, craftsmen and architects be willing to take on projects much further away from home? And what does he see as the limits and limitations of this method of working? Hi. Um, so, no, we are practicing now in major parts of uh, uh, Western India and Northern India also. We are doing something in Delhi. We are doing something in Gujarat. Uh, we, we have been doing something in Maharashtra. So, we have been doing in different, different geographical areas. And uh, uh, we are even uh, right now in talks for we are doing the Sharjah Triennale. So we will be doing something back in Charja also. So we are doing in different geographical locations. When your site is your God, for us, there is one cardinal rule that the site is your God. You know, whatever materials that come, that Gandhi, Gandhi rule of, you know, like procuring materials from that particular area would definitely help us solve most of the problems, you know. And uh, that is something which we believe very strongly in. <laughs> Today, we are a group of 22 architects working from different places. We do not have an office, but the internet, right now I am also on the road, and the internet is allowing all of us to be in the same uh, virtual hall and talk uh, to each other. 
so definitely the same thing is applicable to practice you do not need an office you do not need a fancy desktop and setup and table uh, the entire country is your table so we actually practice from uh, most of my architects the 22 of them are from are uh, living and working at the sites they have a laptop we do our drawings and we transfer it Thank you. You know, there's a uh, there's an extension question, if I may, Devashri, uh, from uh, Fawaz Khan, who's also been listening. Uh, and he says, you know, that he's excited about your presentation, the waste as building material is catching a trend, he says, almost like an architectural movement. What are the kinds of precautions you take while working with these materials? And how do you post evaluate them? Or do you or have you not yet? So basically, our training started with uh, all Any material which you see in the presentation has been worked on for a minimum of seven years. We have tried it somewhere originally. We have worked on it in some, some basic area because we are always creatures of the site. We have some nooks and corners where we can work with these materials. So if you are seeing a shuttered debris wall in my presentation, it has been worked and worked and worked again until it has come to a major construction material. Uh, we also go for the, uh, you know, like the Indian legal scenario is kind of a bit tough. So the national cement and building materials often take a long time to 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 actually uh, certify certain materials as paka building materials. Uh, it is a bit of a dilemma because some of the rules actually say that you have to build with these materials and only then, uh, you know, it will be certified. So we have even uh, laid we have even got patent patent pending in our cases for our shuttered debris wall. So a lot of analysis actually happens of the site um, in, in, in various labs because we do not own a, a, our own personal lab. We generally use the laboratory, structural laboratory of Trivandrum and uh, our regional research laboratory in Trivandrum and also the REC Calicut has been used. Of late, uh, we have been trying to use the Chennai IIT, which is more uh, registered. So yes, there is a lot of analysis that happens behind uh, and, and we have to make sure that the material tech, the technique lasts for a long period of time. So uh, mm -hmm. even on the field, it is a seven year process yeah. and off the yeah. field, it is continuous. Thank you. So, Vinu, I, I, want one, I want to ask you one question out of my curiosity, and then I'll ask the last question to both of you, and we'll have to close up because we're running out of time. All good things must come to an end. Um, I'm just very curious, your ledge house, what is the roof made of? Surely the bamboo is only a superficial cover, no? Yeah, the ledge house is a casuarina pole. It is, uh, it is not bamboo. Casuarina poles are, uh, are used generally as a scaffolding. So what happens is the casuarina pole is overlaid with a ferrocement shell uh, mm -hmm. into ferrocement, mm -hmm. which is a thin one and a half inch, uh, you know, uh, ferrocement uh, mesh kind of concrete. And on top of that, again, we put casuarina so I that see. the flora and fauna can survive on the roof. The roof I is see. supposed to be an extension of the nature, <laughs> that, that kind of idea. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So look, my last question to you, and then I'll sum up is, I think to both of you, and maybe Rohan, you can go first, and Venu, you can go second. I mean, in the decade that you all have both practiced, uh, what is, from your learnings, what is your feedback in terms of pedagogy and education? Do you think architects going through the five-year period and doing internships after three months, uh, is that model... Uh, a viable model? How have you seen that happen? Uh, we know you talk about the 22 architects sitting with laptops on sites, all in a virtual hall. Uh, yes, they get rooted to the site, but they don't have the interactions face to face with peers. Maybe there's a way they do. I don't know. What do you, what do you, how do you reflect on what we are taught or what you learned or have you unlearned many things or has your education been useful? Rohan, if you go first. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was constantly thinking about this because for like a brief period of time I was teaching and uh, uh, so uh, somewhere I feel the, the maybe the period of internship could have could be increased in like maybe from six months to a year or a one and a half year because uh, if the students they can spend more time in an office or on the field or uh, working with a particular architect on real projects, I think uh, 
they will get a better understanding of uh, architecture. I mean, it's similar to, I mean, uh, uh, the cricket comes to my mind right now because the players, they play uh, practice matches, uh, you know, and that's how they get trained. I mean, and those are like real situations that they encounter rather than the net practice. So that's the analogy I look at. Uh, if if the, the students, if they can get involved in projects at a very early stage, and maybe five years, I feel a little too much. This is my personal thinking. Uh, maybe the course can be of five years, but uh, the academic and uh, the internship can be, you know, maybe 50, 50 or 60, 40 or, you know, somewhere mm -hmm. there about. Because most of the learning happens outside the school, I feel, when one encounters a real situation or like a real project. Thank, thank you, Rohan. We know. I share uh, whatever Rohan has said. It's absolutely true. You know, I, I share exactly the same sentiments what Rohan has shared. But also, we we should understand that architecture course is an introductory course. Our real real work is happening on the field. When I got out of college, a simple mason could uh, you know uh, uh, could could literally. Um, you know, stay, you know, like a, make a problem for, for my suggestion because simply I didn't have the practical knowledge and that Mason would have never worked, in, uh, you know, like never studied anything. So I feel like our, our experience on field has to undergo a lot of change. And in some sense, uh, like we, we are reaching soon to a stage where the skill is also running out in some sense. Uh, we had to bring the skill back. Uh, many of them feel architecture has, I, I, I certainly feel architecture has gone back to just being on the drafting board or on the virtual scale, you know, uh, we have to communicate with real people, real masons, you know, we have to inspire them. Uh, that is, I think, a facet of architecture, which we have to really train our kids. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, I think one of the implications, this is just a comment, and I don't know if you want to respond, you can. I mean, one of the questions also is creating the infrastructure for that. No, I mean, if you're describing that uh, you have interns who will camp on a site with a laptop, what is the infrastructure that supports them that can encourage? They, they might be passionate about working with one of you just because of the good work you're doing. But finally, if we have to make all of this sustainable, we have to think more systemically about our education process, about that one-year internship and what is the infrastructure that would support them to uh, live on uh, uh, Vinu Daniel's site or on Rohan Ch Chohan's way out site on a highway to supervise something and learn from it. Uh, without any support system. So I think that partly is the lacking and that's why I describe uh, the big cities as these black holes that are sucking up all uh, our resources, right? Uh, so is there any reflection there? We know how do you manage that with interns on your site? Those snakes, I mean, the snakes were there while the site was being built. <laughs> My son was also there, Guru. So <laughs> he was also playing in the same place. So uh, see, why must a, an intern architect have more facilities than my mason? My mason is also leaving at the site. Mm -hmm. He's not somebody who is going away. Yeah. The mason is also a 25 year, 25 year old, uh, you know, very, very good kid. Just yeah. because he comes from a, a, a background, mm -hmm. you know, suddenly, why is this difference between labor camp and architect's office? Yeah, no, no. So that, no, that becomes, if we have to make the transition, and that's the reason we are calling this tra arch the architectures <laughs> of transition. Uh, if you have to make that transition, uh, I think we have to address both issues. We have to address the issue of the inequity, which is why is the Mason have less facilities and less privilege than exactly. the architect who's trained. Exactly. And, and so therefore we have to think of it like that in a way that we can make the transition to create that equity then. But it you won't wouldn't... happen on its own is just the point I'm making. But, but you wouldn't believe that most of the intern architects who come have better relationship with the on-site Masons than even the lead architect as me. You know, okay. they share a chicken fry, yeah, they share a drink, they they are there. And you should understand that the best community is formed from the, this type of interactions. Yeah. We as a profession are becoming too white collared, I believe, you know, yeah. and not really listening to real problems, I, I feel. Right. No, I, I have no disagreement with that. You're only reinforcing what I'm saying. Uh, my point is only this, that I think as a community, we have to collectively think about how we create the infrastructures to support this shift 
to these other forms of practice. And uh, and I think I think I believe at least I'm saying this for myself that as a profession we haven't paid enough and en enough attention. And I just want to use that as a segue to close because we really have run out of material. There were many other very good questions in the chat which we could not pick up, but I think some of them were answered, which have to do with how do you convince clients about the materials you're using, which Ayaz Hosham, who's going to be one of our speakers, has asked from Afghanistan, uh, and there are many others. But I just want to close by saying that I think the importance, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to present. Uh, thanks, Devashree, for the questions and flagging some of these out. But I think what you uh, both, I think, make me think about is the ecology of your practices, which is, I think, Rohan, you're creating a kind of, you're identifying a set of issues and yeah. you're creating uh, mm -hmm. ecology of infrastructure. Uh, you're creating places for rest and safety for women. Uh, you're creating and addressing sanitation, but you're thinking about it ecologically in the sense that uh, it's a broader network that, and that's why you're thinking systemically in terms of modules that can be expanded and replicated. There's a kind of industrial bias in it, but it in a case like this, perhaps it's very relevant and you're doing it as minimally as you can do, which is respectful of resources. Vinu does this in another way with the parameters that he sets. And I think Vinu, your work also addresses this question of ecology, the ecology of practice, uh, the ecology of craftspeople. And, you know, in I think for all of us, and I say this I mean, I, 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 I say this, including myself in the conversation, so please don't read this as a criticism. I think we have to look at these new directions more critically. So we know, I think, for example, I think the, the, the use of waste from whether it's washing machines, et cetera, has larger implication and it ties in a bit to uh, the question the other Rohan asked, Varma, uh, which is, you know, is yes. So, so if for you the site is sacred, and the 150 masons can be more mobile, there is also a human ecology of place, and that gets disrupted. And so, therefore, what are the trade-offs? I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I think we have to think in those terms. Similarly, the network of waste materials. Uh, sometimes, yes, of course, it can be within the five miles because we're producing enough waste. But if we have to think and change systemically practices in the way you seem to be implying, then we have to think about the ecology of waste and how it can move and you know, you know what yeah. has what implications in the future in the same way as we are testing materials, we can test emissions from waste and figure out a whole ecology for that. So, I mean, these are all great beginnings and fantastic provocations, which I think we as a, uh, as a community are grateful to you both for bringing to the fore. Uh, but clearly, there's a lot more work for us all as a community to do. And we know you should put on your camera so we can thank you at least virtually and see you. Uh, but um, thank you very much for participating in this conversation. This is a conversation that's going to go on for the whole year and beyond. Please, please join us for the other yes. conversations I saw today in mm -hmm. among the participants. There are many people who have already spoken and people who are going to speak. Uh, and hopefully at some point we can do a collective conversation in person, yeah. Uh, yeah. maybe either at one of the rest stops that Rohan has designed or one of the wonderful places that Venu has created. Uh, and uh, I, I look forward to that in the future. So thank you both. Thank you, everyone. for thank attending. You. Thank you so much. And, and, you. and see you uh, on the, the, the next three Saturdays. We'll send out yeah. uh, the 5th of November, the 12th of November, and the 19th of November. And we'll send out mailers as soon as we can. Take care. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye. Bye.